Thank you. Hopefully, it's all right. The, all right. The,
Okay, can folks hear me online? Somebody, get, oh, great, thank you, Mike. I, I appreciate the nod, always helpful. Uh, okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. And maybe there are a few other folks that find their way into the room here uh, before we get going. Thank you all for uh, for attending the first in our series of events on evidence-based uh, practice in graduate education. My name is David Feldon. I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies in the College of Education and Human Services. And uh, I'd like to thank both uh, uh, Richard Cutler, the Dean of the Graduate School, as well as the ETE office for uh, working with us to uh, to bring this uh, this oppor learning opportunity uh, uh, to everyone across campus. Uh, we have a couple more that uh, will be happening throughout the semester, one in about three weeks, and then the other uh, towards April when uh, weather will not be affecting whether or not people are coming to uh, coming here in person. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Christine Fund. She is a uh, senior scientist at the Wisconsin Center for Educational Research and one of the leading experts on the uh, development of, uh, of research mentoring uh, for faculty and students. So I'm going to keep the intro very brief because she's brought a lot to share with us today. I'm going to uh, hand it over. Um, I will be uh, monitoring the, the chat if folks online have questions uh, and uh, uh and want to be heard, I'll be keeping track of that. We're going to try to save them for the end. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Fund. So your face is on this camera. Okay. Uh, and uh, and then you can just share, uh, just share the screen. Right. The as long as I don't have to look at my own face uh, in front of me, right? Isn't that the worst on Zoom? All right, let me screen share. We tested this out four minutes ago, so we're in good shape. All right. Thank you. 
that look someone on zoom uh, can somebody let me know if um, that looks okay. Thank you, Mike. And I realize so when I, I'm going to move this just a little. All right, because I think that I'm going to be looking in a very weird direction. It'll work. All right. Thanks so much uh, for folks uh, coming out in person. I uh, appreciate it. And for the folks on Zoom, um, I really appreciate um, the kind invitation um, from David to come for this um, inaugural launch of the series. Uh, we've known each other for quite a while. Um, we can't, whenever we get together, we can't talk fast enough to think about all the collaborations we want to embark on. So I really uh, enjoyed uh, having the opportunity. In full disclosure, I was also drawn by the skiing. Uh, so my husband and I uh, came in early and spent a wonderful day at Beaver Mountain yesterday. It was our first time there. The canyon drive up was amazing. The skiing was amazing. Um, so I'm coming off a ski high. My legs are very tired, um, but I'm definitely feeling refreshed. So that was exciting. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a cell and molecular biologist by training. Um, so not an educational researcher. Uh, and, but about 17 years ago, pivoted to start to work on both classroom interventions and research lab interventions uh, to help optimize the training experience and the learning experience for students, especially undergrads, graduate students, and postdocs. Um, and my work now is all focused on advancing the science and practice of mentorship. And so that has been... Um, really a joy and a privilege to work in that space. And we're gonna tell you a little bit uh, about the work that I've been leading with lots of different programs, but the ones most relevant today are our Center for the Improvement of Mentored Experience in Research, or CIMR, um, and the National Research Mentoring Network, which is an NIH-funded initiative. And I should also say before I start, I'm gonna to get to share with you thing uh, work that is really the work of hundreds of people across the country. I can't put all their names here um, and I'll try to highlight specific folks as we go, but I definitely am sharing you work that is absolutely not just mine. I just have the privilege of getting to direct a lot of it. So I wanna thank all those folks. So uh, what we're gonna spend some time together talking about is I wanted to just make sure that we were all on the same uh, page in terms of the research that's out there on mentorship and it mattering. You're gonna say probably right away is why is she using the word mentorship, not mentoring? And I promise you we'll get to that. Um, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about efforts to use mentorship education to improve mentoring relationships. And that's really been the space that we've been working in. And then I wanna talk a little bit about the work we've done over the last uh, 15 years to develop interventions to improve mentoring relationships test them, disseminate them, adapt them, and expand them um, across the country. And then at the very end, before we turn it over to discussion and Q&A, is really talking about mentorship ecosystems and what organizations and institutions can do to start to advance their culture of mentorship. So, and as we go, I'll kind of give a, I'll have a slide that says, we're going to talk about mentorship matters. Um, so uh, David invited me to talk about a lot of things. And so that always runs the risk of trying to share too much and it being overwhelming and losing our place in it um, or sharing too little and um, folks saying like, well, what about? So if you have questions as we go, um, please just jot them down um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. The things that we can't get to that are still left in question for you, um, absolutely, um, please reach out to me, please reach out to David and we can follow up on email for sure. David, anything I forgot. All right. So I want to spend the first little bit just talking about mentorship matters. And I think anytime we think about mentorship, I want it to be grounded in your own experience. I think that's one of the really wonderful things about working in this area is that um, almost all of us, hopefully all of us have had experiences of having people mentor us in our lives, however you define that. So I thought we would start, and I, I'm not going to do a poll. So for folks in the room, we're going to literally hold up our hand. And for folks in Zoom, you can actually use the chat and just put a number. So I want you to just think for a minute how impactful your mentoring relationships, however you define that, have been up till this point in your career. So one's going to be extremely important and five's going to be not at all. All right. So David, as folks online share with us, can you like calculate an average really quick? Uh, and folks in the room, you can just raise your hand. 
one to five, how important have your mentoring relationships been in your career this far? Okay, it is just a one with absolutely no variability in the room. We've got one variation point. One variation point, all right. So, um, so just wanted to take a minute and just say your experience, which is critical, says it matters. And I'll tell you that there's a lot of literature that backs that up. So I'm not gonna read this whole slide. I always put this slide in here to just have the weight of, there's a lot of work that says mentorship matters. It matters for persistence. It matters for degree attention. Um, it matters for integration into the academic um, community. Um, and this in particular, a lot of work's been done in science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine. It is important for increased recruitment. It's important for people seeing themselves as competent. And it's important even for other very classic markers like publication. So it matters for lots of the things that we like to assess and say are critical um, in the work that we do. And it matters personally, as indicated by you all, mostly everybody saying one, probably somebody said two. I don't know, I won't. Four, all right, so four, somebody having saying its importance is not weighing very um, positively and um, that's always unfortunate. But here's what we know is that even though it's super important, trainees have unequal access to mentoring overall and they have less access, um, they don't have equal access to quality mentoring and it varies by groups. And we know that scholars across career stages from underrepresented groups receive less mentoring overall and less quality mentoring. So here's this disparity. We know something matters to all of these things I just showed you to your own personal experience and we have a disparity in who has access to it and the quality of it. And this is what we know about mentors, or even though mentors spend a lot of time on their mentorship. And yeah, what can I adjust? Yes. Oh, you're so great, because I, I couldn't tell on my screen too. Sorry. You can hide it, I don't need to see it. Right. There you go. Thank you. All right, so um, we know that even though mentors usually are well-intended, spend a lot of time on that work, most have not received any formal mentor training. There's a lot of mentors that don't believe that the socio-emotional and instrumental functions that are part of mentorship is part of their work. We know that many don't know about, and even if some know about it, they don't believe in the realities of their trainees, especially those from underrepresented groups in STEM, and many adopt a colorblind ideology. So that is, in some cases, that's a little bit stressing. And the other, it's an incredible opportunity to address that gap and that challenge. And that's really kind of where we've been working. So there is a huge national focus on mentorship. Um, and that has been just emerging at this incredible rate over the last two decades in particular. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a lot of work on mentorship done earlier. A lot of it was in the business world um, where there's a, been a huge focus on mentorship for a long time. But there was this reality uh, check and this real leaning into mentorship um, in the last, especially 15 years. So I just gave a couple examples to um, bring this home. We've got the National Science Foundation requiring things like postdoc mentoring plans. All of the undergrad research programs now are undergrad research and mentoring programs. Um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute that we've done a lot of work with, they require 30 hours of mentorship education for anyone who takes their prestigious Gilliam graduate students. Um, and we provide that. Uh, they have an entire scientific, scientific mentorship initiative that just launched in their new $10 billion campaign. The National Institutes of Health, all training grants coming out of the, one of the institutes and now the others are now requiring mentor training. Uh, and they invested millions of dollars in the National Research Mentoring Network to increase access to good equality mentorship. And then the National Academy of Sciences has been noting the need for equality mentorship um, in its consensus reports over the last couple of years. And the most recent report um, that was completely focused on the science of effective mentorship in STEM came out in 2019. Um, and I had the opportunity to be on that consensus committee, which was an amazing experience to look at what was known and all the stuff that's not known. So that's where this term mentorship came in. So on the committee, you can imagine one of the first things this committee was charged with was coming up with a definition of mentorship that we were gonna use for this um, consensus report. And we spent 
hours combing the literature and debating what it should be. And because there are so many definitions out there. And the first thing that was decided was that we weren't going to call it mentoring is we were gonna call it mentorship because it would force a pause to say it's not just about the mentor, that it's about the mentor and the mentee in mentorship. Mentoring focuses all on the mentor and that mentorship was gonna be defined as a professional working alliance in which individuals work together over time to support the personal and professional growth and development and success of both relational partners. So this is mentor and mentee both gain through the provision of both career and psychosocial support. And what we mean by that is career support, support, which actually traditionally has been a real focus of mentorship. It's been on career guidance, skill development, sponsorship, was going to be equally weighed with psychosocial support, the emotional support, the role modeling. And those are both critical and aimed at talent development. So what I'd like to offer is this is the definition and really the framework that we've been using in our work. Um, it just got more solidified with this definition. One of the things that campuses can do that's super easy, but really important is to just come to common language around mentorship. Because we often talk about everyone will have a mentor or we will have mentoring programs and we're not even talking about the same thing. Um, and so one really important thing is what are we talking about when we're talking about mentorship? So one of the things that this consensus report did is it has a series of nine recommendations and they are nine recommendations for um, institutions to consider when advancing a culture of mentorship. And number two is using evidence-based approaches to support mentorship. And so the call was that program leaders should support mentorship by ensuring there's evidence-based guidelines, tools, and processes for mentors and mentees to set clear expectations, engage in regular assessment, and participate in mentorship education. Um, now this was really pivotal for us who work in mentorship education because it continued to raise the focus and call um, for engagement in evidence-based mentorship education. So there are other nine recommendations um, in, some, in this consensus report. There's also a Cliff Notes online toolkit, which actually has all the recommendations and by stakeholders. So it has recommendations and tools for mentors, mentees, program directors, all the way up to provost presidents um, all across the stakeholders and gives some specifics of things you might wanna think about doing. So I think one of the things um, that David and I talked about was that this was an opportunity, you know, as Utah State University is really emerging um, in its next phase of growth to think about the culture of mentorship that it wants to embrace and advance in partnership and aligned with that. All right, so I'm gonna pause there for a second, just say that we're gonna now spend a couple minutes talking about mentorship education. Um, and this is really what I mean by that, are any interventions, approaches that are aimed at improving the mentoring relationship. So there are some really great resources and folks who are working on best ways to develop mentoring programs. Um, and we can certainly talk about that in the Q&A, but I wanna hyper-focus in on how do you actually improve the relationships between mentors and mentees? Because that's where we've been focusing. So our center really, um, which was launched in 2015, out of really what we saw as necessity to have a, some kind of national training hub for mentorship education. There were all these different efforts happening all over the country, but there wasn't something pulling it together. So what Simmer does, um, and I'm seeing you take a picture of the slides and you're fine. I was gonna say, David has them to send, he can share them with all of you. You can have all of these. Um, so if it, that takes any uh, cognitive load off of you, um, you are welcome to, not only can you have them, you can use them. Um, so if you wanna make a pitch to somebody in your department or your program, go for it. Um, we are all about advancing this work in any way and giving resources. Um, so, what Net Simmer does is it has taken the stuff that's out there, much of which we've been uh, developed or collaborated to develop, but also things that have been developed out there that we had nothing to do with, but are amazing and should be disseminated um, and try to put them in one place. So we have um, freely available, and I'll show you in a second, as well as folks can, can hire our principal facilitators to implement mentor training workshops across disciplines and career stages mentee training. I'm not going to talk a lot about mentee training, but just as much work that we've done in training mentors is training mentees how to be effective in their relationships. 
We have links to online self-paced asynchronous training. We have trained the trainer. So how do you train facilitators to implement these evidence-based approaches? We have implementation workshops and consult, con consultants available to help institutions develop programs to advance their work in the culture of mentorship. So Simmer really is a place that holds all of this and um, it serves as a dissemination mechanism for anyone who'd like to use it. The one thing though that is um, that we have held to since the beginning is that we will not put anything up on our website that's not evidence-based. Now that doesn't mean that there's not great stuff out there that hasn't has funding to test, but we won't put up materials that haven't been tested. And that's because that came, became one of our core critical elements and values that the center agreed to. So the approach uh, that we've been taking um, for the last well, 17 years or so, it's process-based. Our mentorship education uses case studies and group problem solving to have mentors and mentees learn together. So when folks engage in our mentorship education, it's typically small groups of mentors who get together and discuss best practices and then link to resources. So it's aimed at awareness raising and collective learning and reflection. It provides this kind of confidential, brave, professional environment um, to share the experience of mentors across experience. So we like to kind of, you think about um, often, you know, teaching has been done in a silo and then you get all the instructors together and they go, oh my gosh, we could share these challenges. We could help each other collectively problem solve and link each other to resources. Mentorship education is the same thing. Um, and then we link to things that are out there. So to give you a sense of that, um, I want to first talk about what competencies our training covers. So they won't be rocket science. They're about relationship advancement. So it's aligning expectations. It's promoting professional development, communication, equity and inclusion, fostering independence, assessing understanding, and lots more um, that are on our website. So the original curriculum is a facilitation guide with materials and prompts for facilitators to guide folks through about one hour of an interactive um, case-based material for each of these competencies. So what does it look like? So I thought it might be fun to give you an example. This one is from um, uh, the biological sciences. Um, and so I'll just give you a second to read it, whether you're online or in person. It probably may not be a context for most of you, but if we were in biology, these would be very, this would be something that a lot of mentors would be struggling with in terms of um, mentoring graduate students and undergrads. So I'll let you read it. Gives you a break from my voice for a minute too. You always feel when someone finishes because they make a really bad face on the last side. So here's what I want to ask really quick is not what's your reaction to this case. That's what we would do. If we were in mentorship education session, I'd say, what's the initial reaction to this? What issues does this raise? I want to go back to this list of competencies. What competencies do you think you could talk about with this case? What issues would it raise? And I'll ask the folks in the room, people on chat can say too. Which of these could you imagine talking about in the context of this scenario? All of them, right? Anybody wanna say this one really would stand out for me? What's everybody's like role in that situation? Hmm? What's another one that would come up? Right, like that last sentence, right? Maybe not the most effective communication, maybe well intended, wanted to like relieve some tension in the room, probably didn't, might have landed in a really ineffective way. Yeah. So, this is the kind of thing where you could imagine in you could have a conversation about what's the reaction, what are you going to do now, what could be avoided, where's this coming from. Um, what can be the impact on the people involved? A lot of people in this situation are like, oh my gosh, should you get all three people in a room? How did the postdoc learn how to mentor? So it can go lots of directions. And then you would link it to resources on effective communication, on aligning expectations, on considerations of different elements of identity here and how that might land based on who each person is. 
Um, so you can imagine it's super rich and then having people reflect on what does that say about your own practice? What do you do when you've said things and then later gone, ooh, that probably, I, I might have to backtrack on that. That probably came out. I was probably trying to help there. I always grimace in this because I'm one when I get nervous, I just start talking. So I just walk myself in these kind of situations all the time. So how do I prevent myself from doing that? Okay. So what would happen? We'd have a discussion. Then we'd talk about strategies across the group of mentors. And then we would be, um, so we would give, in this case, readings on providing feedback, tools from aligning expectations, and then enhancing communications across diversity. So that gives you a little sense. So what I wanna share with you then is how we've adapted things and then how we've studied them. So the original curriculum was designed for the mentors of undergrads in biology. So students who were coming in to do summer, summer research for eight to 10 weeks across the summer, undergrads from all over the country at the University of Wisconsin, they were typically underrepresented students who were paired with predominantly white mentors. And most of them were either with grad students and postdocs, or they were with a faculty member or some combination of the trio, like in that case study where you'd have the faculty member agreeing to take the student and then assigning them to a postdoc and then something going on, like was the postdoc ready to mentor the student, a lot of that kind of stuff. And we built that curriculum, we implemented it, we tested it, we published on it. And then we were able to use that to, um, over the years, get money to adapt that curriculum. So one of the adaptations, and all of these are on our portal, which is simmerproject.org. Um, all the materials I'm gonna tell you about, every curriculum, every case study that's been tested, both for mentor training and mentee training is all free and it's all here. And we adapted it for lots of different audiences. So what you can see here is we have the mentors of undergrads in astronomy and astrophysics, the mentors of postdocs and grad students in biomedical, and this one, the mentors of junior faculty and senior postdocs in clinical and behavioral research. Now, I don't come from the clinical and behavioral research world. I didn't come from the NIH funded world. But what this allowed us to do is access NIH funding to test it. And so what we were able to do is we were able to take this adaptation of the original curriculum for clinical and translational researchers. And we had four two hour sessions was the um, most likely uh, implementation. And we were able to do a randomized control study of this across sites across the country. And so what that looked like is we recruited 283 mentor-mentee pairs. These were senior faculty mentors working with junior faculty or senior postdocs in clinical and translational science across 16 sites across the country. And every mentor and mentee was interviewed at baseline and it included the interview included them actually also taking some quantitative data using a mentoring competency assessment scale we had validated, which basically aligned with the competencies. Where were you on these skills for communication, aligning expectations, assessing understanding? And then the mentors were randomized into control or um, training groups. And then for the group in the training arm, they implemented this eight hours of training and then everyone, and then they took a survey, and then everybody was interviewed uh, with a 98% uh, retention rate, which I always am blown away with, had nothing to do with me. The research team was incredible. They, they did it all. And this was done across about a year and a half. So what I first want to show you is um, using this validated mentoring competency assessment, mentors who were trained self-reported um, gains in all of the areas that align with the curriculum. And so they said, I had gains in communicating effectively and that was right after the training. And then we interviewed everybody six months later. And what I'm showing you here is that the mentors who went through the intervention uh, statistically reported significant changes in their effectiveness compared to those who did not um, at the pre and post. Now, folks will say like, well, they wanted to say that they learned something and there's all those caveats in this, but it was the first time we were able to do something on this scale to at least apply this type of approach. And then what was really interesting is we asked them three, three to six months post, what did you change in your practice as a mentor? And what was super interesting, and you could not be said the green, which is implemented, you could not be marked as implemented unless you gave a specific thing. You couldn't say, I changed something. You had to say something like, I'm using a written mentoring agreement now, 
or I've moved the location of, this was a real example, I've moved my chair when my mentee comes in so that I'm not facing my computer. I take my chair out in front of my desk. Or I have started asking mentees about what aspects of their lived experience and identity are more salient to them. And so we can have a conversation how that impacts our relationship. So it had to be specific. So you can see 87% of the mentors who went through the training had a specific implemented change compared to 42% of the control. And whenever I show this slide, folks go, why are 42% of the control group having an implemented uh, change? Anybody want to guess? They didn't, and that's great. They actually were told not to. And so everyone, the mentees were blinded to the status of their training, and they were told not to talk to their colleagues because some were... Um, uh, in the randomization. And we actually know that their mentees were blinded because we asked their mentees if they thought their mentor took training. A good guess. So it turns out just asking the control group in the interview about did you, the, the mentoring competency assessment domains made them change things. They said, well, when you asked me how I align expectations and I had to rate myself, it made me think I should do something. And so even though I didn't take the training, I did something. So, which is kind of amazing uh, about the power of just taking a moment to reflect on practice and is really exciting in terms of thinking about how easy it is to intervene on these um, relationships. So I won't show all the mentee data, but to your um, great answer uh, about the status of talking about it, we did ask mentees and mentors, um, uh, but the mentees in particular, when the mentees rated the effectiveness of their mentors, the, they rated the mentors in the trained group higher than the untrained group, and they were blinded to the status of the training. So, um, so building on this, we then had a great platform to start to uh, apply for grants to go beyond a randomized control trial. And so to do that, what we did is we recruited a group of what we call principal facilitators. This was part of our work with the National Research Mentoring Network and is now part of our work with SIMR. So we have about 22 people from around the country that are trained to implement this approach to mentorship education. And they implement both mentor and mentee training. They also do train the trainer workshops and they go out all over the country uh, and do training. And what's really great then is we use one common assessment platform and we collect data from every implementation so that now we could start to look at things, what we call out in the wild. So today I'm going to talk about the data from their work, and these are highly trained facilitators. We have a whole nother arm of work of folks who go through our train the trainer workshop and then go and implement. And we can look at their data as well um, and how they do. But I wanted to focus on the 78 principal facilitator led trainings, um, basically between 2018 and 2021. So this group um, through Simmer led uh, training for 1400 mentors or more. And we do the same data collection. So we have about a response rate across all of those for about 56%. Yeah. Since 1400 Yeah. So the, the group is actually, and I, I didn't put the demographics up here. Um, so they are implementing to mentors across career stage, across discipline, and across demographics. Now, the predominant, just by the nature of the makeup, most of those mentors are going to be white identified and we get more females signing up for training than males. You wouldn't be surprised, but the numbers are big enough and good enough that we can get the spread to start to look statistically at models. So thanks for asking. So this is back to that mentoring competency assessment. So you might be like, okay, does just at the base of the self-reported um, learning across these hold when you're not in a randomized controlled trial. And so now when you're looking at uh, these numbers, you can see that, you know, across all of these different implementations with all of these different facilitators and all these different mentors and mentees and contacts, you still see those gains. And of course, folks in the room will go like, what does it look like when you cut it by gender? What does it look like by career stage? Yes, it's all in process. And, and um, we can talk a little bit about that in the Q&A if you want. I didn't put all those cuts, but now we're in a space where you can start modeling. You can start looking at correlations. You can start looking what works for who and in what context. But we are only able to get to this point um, uh, in the last couple of years. 
So in that light, we have really gotten excited about digging in what works and in what context. So because we were implementing lots of different trainings, we started having different amounts of training. So this is just giving a sense across all of those participants um, what a level of training. And you can see we've got short training, we've got long training. So now you can look at dosage. And so what I'll, what we were able to show is that mentors, and this is them re reporting how much, they're rating the quality of the mentoring they can provide after the training. And what you can see is that we just lumped them all, you can look by our, that folks in higher dosage training are, experience are saying, I feel like the quality of mentoring I'm able to provide is higher. Now you're gonna say, what do their mentees say? So there's a whole line of work looking at the alignment of what mentors say and what mentees say that is really emerging now. So we're able to look at dosage. This is super interesting because as folks start asking, what is the requirement for mentor training and how much and which competencies, we can't speak for NSF or NIH, but we can refer people to what the data suggests. So bottom line is we say, don't go under four hours and you absolutely should use a couple of the competencies that are rated the highest change from, um, from our studies, which are aligning expectations and effective communication. And then we say, and you should never, ever, ever not do equity and inclusion because it's so important. So the other thing is we actually happen to be implementing mentorship education online and in person before COVID forced us to go all online for a couple of years. We had started actually doing online implementations in 2010. So we were able then to scale up across the different modes of training. So you can see here, now we could look at um, participants who had gone through all online training or all, um, and that means synchronous Zoom or face-to-face. -face. And now we could use propensity score matching and we could look at a difference. And what I can tell you is that in our three major assessments that we use, the mode of training doesn't make a significant difference. So you can do this all synchronously on Zoom and expect to get the same results. What does matter is dosage, which I just showed you, and their prior experience mentoring. So you can imagine the more novice you are as a mentor, the more gain you're gonna get. That's not surprising, but you still get significant gains for even mentors who have 15, 20 years of mentoring experience. And in fact, the mentors in that randomized control trial I showed you on average had 15 years of mentoring experience. And so they were very senior experienced mentors still showing gains and their mentees still noticing change. So one of the thing areas that we've been really working on now is a deeper dive into cultural awareness and mentoring relationships. And this work's really been led by my dear friend and colleague, Angela Byers Winston. So we had known from prior work that cultural diversity was often viewed as an interference variable. So we would hear a lot of mentors say, I don't care where you come from, it's just science. Or mentors experiencing culture and science is related, but focusing only on the mentee. So they would say, I think people come in with different perspectives and those perspectives alter how they view research and how they view the lab, lab environment, but it was they. Not me as mentor, my identity of impacting how I view the research and how I view mentoring relationships. Mentors and mentees in our qualitative study completely disagreed on whose role it should be to bring it up. Mentors said, well, I'll talk about it if mentees bring it up. And mentees are like, I'm not in the power position. I'm not bringing it up. But everybody thought, oh, yeah, we, well, we should bring it up. Actually, that's not true. 87.9% said they should bring it up. So here's a classic quote. Well, if where they're from and how they're communicating is important to the discussion, they should feel empowered to bring it up. Um, and, and this is really a point we bring up with mentors is that you're putting the person who has less power in, in the decision point of bringing it up when it's the often most salient to them because they're often the person who also has minoritized identities. And no matter whose responsibility it was, over and over, folks would say they just don't feel equipped to handle it. This study was done prior um, 2020 when things really started um, to be reckoned with in terms of the racialized violence across the country in terms of having to really grapple. So uh, we start embarked on I guess it was in 2016, the development of culturally or mentorship training. This is a nine hour training. It has three parts and it has pre-work and it delves with mentors digging into their interpersonal, intrapersonal, interpersonal and skill building. I won't go into all the pieces for time. 
And what I want to show is just that what we were able, what was able to be shown from the trial of this um, was that we saw mentors saying they were intentionally creating more opportunities for mentees to bring up issues like race and ethnicity, and they were respectfully broaching these issues more often. And so what I will say about this work um, before I pivot is we've had an opportunity now with um, HHMI, as I mentioned, is we provide 30 hours across a year. Some of it's asynchronous online, some of it's face-to-face. -face. That's a mix of our entering mentoring original curriculum and this cultural or mentoring curriculum. Basically, we were charged with take everything you know works and put it into one mega training. And what's really fascinating now, and we've just published this, is what mentees and mentors are saying about their practice and how they're aligned. Mentors saying, here's what I'm now doing in the area of cultural mentoring, and what mentees are saying is happening. And what I can tell you, it's super interesting. It's mentees aren't saying, oh my gosh, my mentor is completely culturally aware now and it's all great. They're saying, my mentor is willing to get messy. My mentor is willing to have conversations that are messy. Sometimes it's awkward, but we're not ignoring it. And so I just wanted to share that with you because it's been a real, it's such an interesting place now of leaning into the discomfort and messiness and the people in positions of power, the, what that does to mentees when mentors are willing to do that, even if it's not perfect. There are lots of fear issues. There's lots of concerns about bringing things up and triggering things like imposter syndrome and all of that. And we dive into that in the training, but just that the basic outcome is that it matters that they try. So the last thing before we kind of open it up is I just wanted to put this mentorship education back into the context of mentorship ecosystems and the culture of mentorship. So when I say mentorship ecosystem is that's really thinking about all the levels at which mentorship could be working. So you've got mentees and mentors, just what they're doing individually. You've got all these mentoring relationships, and that's really where we've been trying to intervene is on those relationships. And then you've got the institutional context. Are you talking about a lab? Are you talking about a department, a program? Are you talking about a, um, uh, a college? Then you've got all these policies. So, okay, if mentors are gonna spend more time on this, who's valuing that? Where does it count? What's the accountability look like? And then of course you have this ever moving target of the social and cultural context, which I think um, in the last three years in particular, we have just felt uh, its salience even more. So that's a lot to think about, but mentorship education is only gonna lean and push in on one part of this and it's in that relational piece. The rest of it has to be considered. And so in the National Academies report that I mentioned earlier, they really called out colleges and universities to support more effective mentorship. And they said you could increase the access to quality mentors, just let people know who they can talk to and monitor the quality of those. Providing mentorship education is a big one. If you, if you do that or you don't do that, at least provide people with tools. So individual development plans are kind of like the classic tool that's been used, but there's also a lot of other tools that can be used. Evaluating mentorship and mentoring relationship effectiveness. But of course, doing that in a way that doesn't uh, call out individual mentors and mentees in a way that people feel like they can't be honest. Using data and research to hold uh, broader conversations and then encouraging faculty to talk about mentorship so it's not done in silos and there's a shared investment in its quality and its accountability. So I thought I'd end before um, we go to questions is with this really beautiful um, piece from Baronda Montgomery, who is just, if any, anyone heard of her, she is was at Michigan State, now she is at, um, Grinnell, right? Yeah, Grinnell, just had a blank there, who is just this amazing plant biologist who is also a scholar in mentorship. And she just writes, because she studies plants and she thinks about growth and ecosystems, she's written about mentorship in that lens. And so she's written that when mentoring, goal attainment, and advancement occur as an ecosystem, then effective and progressive mentoring is not about helping those mentored adapt to toxic water and polluted air, but help them purify the water and clean the air. And this is, a, uh, she references back Weinstein and Surden's critical concept of mentoring. 
And so she says that impactful and effective mentoring is then centered in a learning environment or a context of tending an ecosystem in support of an individual pursuing specific goals therein. The beauty of this approach is that the environment better serves the particular individual while ultimately being changed into a better state to support others as well. This is mentoring as transformation. This is mentoring as progressive environmental stewardship. And I think that she probably more beautifully than anyone else I've read um, really is inspirational in what campuses can achieve. And this is a paper from her uh, and two other wonderful scholars in this arena that kind of lend a visual to that. Is you have met in this complexity, it isn't just about one mentor and one mentee. It's about mentees doing peer mentoring. It's about mentors working together and helping each other. It's about them mentoring lots of people in group mentoring structures. And then there's all this mentorship happening outside our own programs and training environments. And then there's all this environmental stewardship that leaders are really called to that has to lean into the assessment, the accountability, the funding, the mentorship education and the synergies around it. And this is a beautiful, I think, model for where institutions can go. It's not gonna happen in two years. This is a decade worth uh, plan, but there is so much out there now to build on that makes it, I think, much more possible than anywhere we were 10 years ago. So I'm just gonna acknowledge that all of this work again is the work of literally hundreds of people. In particular, I wanna honor the 25 people that we get to work with directly right now um, and lots of funding and lots of support from lots of folks over, as you can imagine, 18 years of work. So I am gonna stop sharing and I almost made it in 45 minutes, David, and open it up uh, to questions. And do you want me to keep that chat open to see or put it to take it down? Uh, either way, I can see I can see it here. I have it up on my All right, phone. I'll take it. Oh, I don't I don't wanna <laughs> no no no, I'll just leave it. I'm not gonna touch it. Actually, I'll do that. All right. So the room is yours and chat. Ask me anything. Uh, and I don't know your name, so tell me who you are. Uh, I'll start in the back. Development kind of um, I have two questions. I'll ask my second. Um, you know, you kind of concluded about talking about cultural awareness and you know, training, and it makes me think of how you know you think about racism as structural. Yeah. Yet most of our interventions are at the individual level, not addressing the structures that are at the top that are perpetuating the system. Yep. So all the trainings we talk about are between the mentor and the mentee. How can we do intervention at the structural level? Yeah. Is that getting presidents and provosts involved in this at the structure of at least an institution? Is that means? <laughs> what are you putting <laughs> um, it, like, but yeah, we, we can address the problem through ind individuals, but it'll be slow. If we can address the systems, mm -hmm. the change will be more radical and quick. Yes. And I always like to say, Systems are not separated from the people. It is individuals in the system. They just exist in different levels of the system and had different access to power. So we can't wait for the system to get fixed while we have individual mentors and mentees who in some cases, especially are literally traumatized. And yet what you want, right, is, is that happening at every level. So I would say my simplest answer is, Yes, and you hear that from mentees going like, well, okay, great, let's affect this, but I'm still in a completely racist system. But bring me to the table to talk about what I wanna see changed in that system and let me know that we're making progress. Not, oh, we'll get there in 10 years, like what's happening? So if we believe that individual relationships are going to be impactful in our culture and system while we're changing systemic policies, then what are we doing to invest in that change? They're not isolated from each other. Those are the people. Um, and so I think, you know, is this is true across the board is it has to be across the ecosystem. But I think what happens often is in the ecosystem is what's happening at each level is invisible to the other level. And so I think my short answer and not easy is it isn't, is it in the hands of the deans? It's 
yes, the people in power have enormous opportunity to change something, but how is that being communicated to folks who are working at other levels and how is what matters to them being communicated? How are we part of the conversation? Because otherwise the conversations are happening separate. So we've heard from a lot of folks, they know, I mean, no, we don't have undergrads who don't understand that it's gonna take a long time to change the system. They wanna at least know that they're being heard and part of the solution. So that may not be a useful answer, but I really do think that ta- that the ecosystem across it and and folks leaning into the fact those are people. It's not the system. We are the system. This is it's just we hold different positions in power. I don't know if your colleagues want to say anything into that answer as well. You got point at is it the dean? Is it? <laughs> We have one comment from, from oh, go ahead. A, a comment and not directly have a question, but uh, uh, apparently through the iTunes network, USU has a small team of faculty who have done the similar training yep. and are beginning to replicate uh, in this. Awesome. So you have folks, at least for the mentorship education piece. So, so one very specific thing is what we even hear with mentorship education is folks started at a campus, but then leadership doesn't get those implementers together to even support just that they are a community of practice who are are trying to be part of the change. So those are small things that you can do is to just acknowledge where you have those places of intervention and support just them getting together. And when I say that, I mean, literally bring them together for lunch every semester and say, what change are you helping that's gonna be in line with the system change? Little things can make a huge impact in folks. I can see even on our campus is the folks who are out there doing mentorship education in this, all we were like, would you just bring them together? Just let them know you see them and you will buy them lunch. And they will figure, they'll sit around a table for an hour and come up with the next thing they want. Questions? Sure. Uh, um, I'm Scott Bates. I'm the department head in psychology. And my question in psychology is one of these sciences that is super diverse all by itself. Yeah. And I'm interested in sort of where you think disciplinary specificity, what role does it play? Is it none or is it? Yeah. I, I imagine it's important in the context of credibility. But yeah. Where does do, you know, discipline specificity play in this role? So it's so interesting. So we've had uh, multiple grants for the adaptation work. And when you do the adaptation, what we're always very clear about is we have a great starting point and we're really good at helping people adapt it. I don't live in psychology. I would never even presume to understand the culture of psychology. So what we do is we get people together from those disciplines and we say, take the base and tell us what won't work. And what's super interesting is that what you find out across the board is commonalities are more than than, um, differences. However, the differences matter. And they don't just matter in the implementation, they matter in people owning it. So the biggest example was this, is we had had an astrophysics curriculum. And the um, astronomer said, no, 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 no. We need an astronomy curriculum. And we were like, you can't tweak some words? No, no one will use this if it's not astronomy. And so they literally found money to adapt it to astronomy. The differences are so small, but it was buy-in. They said, nobody's going to do it if it's astrophysics. And so we've seen that over and over. Now, I will say the big differences we're seeing is in the adaptations, disciplinary adaptations in the theoretical fields. And Dave and I were talking about the nature of the relationship in theoretical physics is different than experimental. Because of the kind of mentoring, it has more similarities with humanities. And so the humanities curriculum that is now just going to go through beta testing is super interesting in the kind of conversations. You still have to talk about aligning expectations, but they're so different than people doing bench work. You still have to talk about uh, professional development, so different in terms of the kind of career path. So those were where we see the big differences. So I would say the summary of that answer is the nature of the work that you are doing in a mentoring relationship matters more than the disciplines but the discipline matters to people coming in the door. Yeah. And one of the topics that um, I get asked quite a bit, it's not a new thing, but I think it's maybe uh, post COVID has uh, elevated this again. It's more about like good mentorship um, skills for 
into time management, time to completion of their program, whatever it is. But again, often setting that expectation is very important. But then when the time is kind of running out on the clock, that the mentee often feels it's the mentor's responsibility to fix it. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and maybe that means not doing all the original things that were planned. Do you have any guidance for how to help people work with that kind of mentorship where there seems to be always this disparate kind of difference between what the mentee and the mentor and the mentee dreams are, you know, where the, the end point is of the project or program or dream? Right, right, and the and the stories that get told outside of our presence about what are real and perceived endpoints, you know. So we may be like, you have to get this done, but then the talking that goes on in the lunchroom and online is like, don't. Yeah, so there's a whole culture, a socialization around that, and I think you know you're right, and and even the fact that a lot of folks are remote or were remote that exacerbated kind of the, the checking with each other and the getting done. So I think in your question is the recommendation is that what we have found that folks are finding is successful it, and we can share an article with you is that coming during COVID, coming out of COVID, if we just focus on the COVID uh, variable, many other variables, is there has to be a very intentional reassessment and realignment of expectations. And it's it has to do with what has to be accomplished, but there has there's a whole need to attend to how it's being accomplished now. The time management, the communication, the check-ins are different now. And they're not, it's not like we can just go, we have to go to this model. The models are emergent. Um, so what does it look like to check in less regularly when you have less regular face and face can't pop your head in the door. That's a different way of communication, which has to. So we do have some suggestions and some tools and we can share them with David. Um, but the one thing is actually really just calling in exactly what you said is we're in a different place. We have to go back and reassess and realign what we said before. And we have to try it out for like two months and then we have to reassess it again because you can't anticipate what's going to work mentee and neither can I, because we've never been in this place. And that has seemed just that it seems so straightforward, but has been really because they're not, they're grappling too with, I can't get it done. I'm not able to focus the way I was. My priorities have changed all of the things that many of us are experiencing and they have less life experience in most cases to troubleshoot that. So entering into literally this little experimentation of let's try this and see, because we're both trying to figure it out. So um, that's been really interesting. I'm struggling with it, a lot of my team members too. And their expectation of what they can do in a new way of work is actually not very realistic. So one more question maybe, anything online? Nope, nothing online. All right, anything else in the room? That would be useful to you, yeah. You mentioned the one point that you had for signing up with mentorship and training. Can you talk a little bit about that disparity or working towards, you know, balancing who's taking that lead? Yeah. Yeah, and this is something you're seeing across in general professional development. It's been a trend for a long time that you typically, and I don't want any of the men who have engaged in professional development to feel like I'm I'm devaluing that. But in general, you have um, women um, and folks who identify that way um, signing up for professional development across the board at about two thirds to one third. And there's lots of hypotheses why, like they're more willing to accept help and find it. They are putting more priority on that and we can go all down that path. Mentorship uh, is not seeming different. And it's being very clear, and, and mentorship is one of those, just like the DEI work, where you have this unequal holding of the burden of mentorship. And so you have this horrific, perfect storm of more folks doing the work, that, uh, if you do it, look across it, and then being willing to spend even more time doing it better um, and investing that time. And then because then if that does in fact do it better, then they're being sought out more to do more. Um, 
And so this is really tough. So we're, we're just, I think we're on that trend. We actually, um, in the National Research Mentoring Network, there's 11 um, R01 research studies on mentorship broadly defined that, um, so I, I PI the coordination center across all 11 of those. And they see it across all 11 studies and they are everything from grant writing workshops to mentoring interventions. And it's, it is about two thirds women to one third and you're seeing it. The interesting thing is because of the scale of those, we're going to be able to dig into that a little bit more. And that's one line that the community wants to look at. Um, so that is, um, I don't have an answer for that. What I will say though, is one, I think that you, in your question answered it is, I think raising, and this is another thing to culture change, continuing to raise the visibility of the unequal work and then reward that work in meaningful ways is super important. And that has to be at every level. I mean, you're seeing it really pressed on the DEI work, but mentorship I think is no different. And we've got some clever things across campuses that we can show that people are doing in terms of that unequal work, including one really clever one I'll leave you with since we're at time is that if you noted X amount of work you were doing in mentorship and um, engaged in mentorship education, you got access to travel funds for your trainees that others did not. It's a small one, but it says something. All right.